What's up, Sheepdog Nation? I'm excited to bring to you this podcast today. Um, we have a special guest who is doing some really big things in the world. Um, his name is Rich. He is a active law enforcement officer in South Florida. He runs a, an organization um, called Team South Florida. And I looked it up. I found him on Instagram. And I love, love, love what they're doing. They're all about helping law enforcement. Um, they back the blue. I'm excited for you to get to know him a little bit. This episode is going to be extremely important for you. Uh, he has a story that is going to hit home. It's going to hit you in the heartstrings. So make sure you just tune in. Um, Rich, tell us all about you. I'm excited to hear everything you have to say. Oh, man. What an introduction. Well, good morning and happy new year. Yes, happy new year. And, uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. We are yeah, just one one twenty today. One one twenty. Yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Happy for the opportunity and everything. I'm an active police officer coming up on my thirteenth year and I'm currently in South Florida and I've been very blessed and fortunate. It's it's kind of crazy when you have negatives and you're able to turn them into positives. Mm. It means a lot. Absolutely. Well, can you can we just dive right in? Can you just tell us, you know, I got to hear a little bit about your story and I just, it just really, it sure. meant a lot to me. So I just think that um, I would sure. love for you to share that. Absolutely. Well, back in uh, 2007, I went to the police academy in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I met an academy classmate of mine, James Manor, and he was just a gentle giant, humble, humble as can be, and just an incredible human being. He was a uh, he had 10 brothers and sisters. He had a beautiful little daughter. And I had the privilege of working with him for, unfortunately, just a very short time. But uh, he touched everybody that he worked with. And he was always smiling. And I'll absolutely never forget it. It was just, uh, just after midnight on May 7, 2009. He responded to what sounded like a very violent uh, domestic disturbance involving a child at a residence. And, you know, you know, and all the law enforcement officers know, sometimes you hear these calls and they hit you and you just want to get there as quick as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, while he was responding, he was involved in a horrific, horrific vehicle crash. And uh, tragically, uh, he was killed in the line of duty. He was one of uh, four officers from that agency that year that was killed in the line of duty. Wow. Was he, what is 28 he years old on, uh, 28 he was 28 old. years old and he was, uh, just, just shy of his, uh, second year anniversary as a police officer. Wow. And so was he struck and killed instantly? You know, I, I don't know enough of the, I was there on scene and I don't know enough of the details as far as that goes. I know I, I remember he was being transported to uh, UMC trauma and mm -hmm. it was just, uh, you know, a sea of law enforcement, different agencies and everybody was there. But with that tragedy, and it's just remarkable, it was recently, you know, this past May was the 10 year anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to fly out to Las Vegas and I met with his family and I still talk with, uh, you know, one of his brothers pretty frequently. And his daughter graduated high school and the police department showed up to her high school graduation. Aww. And it's just, it's amazing. And his mother, they did a, they did a really nice uh, memorial walk at a beautiful park. It was a beautiful day and it was a tremendous amount of people. And I'll, I'll never forget his mother came out and said, it's amazing. 10 years later, all these people are showing up. They still remember. They're showing their support. The family sees that. And that's part of why we do what we do, because it mm -hmm. sends a message when people say we will never forget, we always hear that at funerals. Years later, sometimes months later, sometimes weeks later, some of these families unfortunately feel like they've been forgotten about, and that's unacceptable. So you're saying as far as what you do? So can you explain that? So you, you obviously, you had this traumatic incident, which I, I want to ask you a few questions around it in a minute, um, but obviously very traumatic. Um, and then, so you started an organization, like, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like what, what came of this? Absolutely. So I was very fortunate. I was, as I explained with uh, Jamie being 
coming up on his second year, I was at a loss. I really didn't know what direction I was going. I just knew I was very angry uh, with the incident. And I was just, I was fine. I came to work. I went home. But I was very angry about the incident. I needed a way to grieve. I needed to figure something out. I needed some sort of outlet. Working out was doing its part, but it wasn't really fixing the issue. Um, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department had an organization called PEEP, and mm -hmm. you could speak with somebody from them. They came, they spoke. That was fine. It didn't really, it helped, but it didn't really solve it. I just felt like I needed to do more. I needed to do something. Mm -hmm. One of uh, Jamie and I, we went to the academy together. One of our academy instructors since retired, Mike Brambilla, um, another gentle giant, huge, com uh, compassionate human being with a huge heart. I was put in touch with him and he welcomed me with open arms to a group of veteran officers. And I, at first I felt out of place because I was so new as a police officer, but here I am with these veterans of 15, 20 plus years, lieutenants and sergeants and detectives, and they participated in a bicycle ride. And the bicycle ride was an annual ride. It was to honor fallen officers. And I just told myself, I'm going to, I never really rode a road bike before. One of the guys on the team sold me a, one of his used bikes for a couple of hundred dollars. And uh, I started riding and I got involved in that event. And, you know, when we get involved in these organizations, and this is a whole other topic, but when we get involved in organizations, you really have to do your homework and your research. And I didn't know anything. I raised my money from friends and family and coworkers. I participated in the ride, and I just felt as if I was riding in honor of Jamie and other fallen officers, and that was it. I transferred over to South Florida, and the agency that I work at now, I approached my then chief. He's also since retired, and he was supportive, and he said, absolutely, go ahead and continue doing the ride. Well, I participated in the ride, but now I was no longer part of the team from Vegas. I was basically my own team. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed uh, one of my coworkers over here and we started doing the ride and, you know, we did the first year, we did the second year, we did the third year. And the more we learned, the more we started to see. And we just felt as if, especially with the loss that we've had in Florida, mm -hmm. that we should be doing more, especially locally. Um, just for example, we had a, this past year, we, we, I don't even want to say only, but we lost six law enforcement officers in the line of duty in Florida in 2019. But the mm -hmm. two years before that, it was, uh, I think it was 11 in 2018 and 12 in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. So it's just, this, this state has been through a lot. Yeah. And from that bike ride, we basically formed Team South Florida. We formed in 2013, but we became really focused and driven in 2015 with a set of initiatives and goals and targets and very pleased to say with the generosity and support, we're able to do a lot with a little. Because you're an actual nonprofit, right? Correct. We're 501c3 and I'm very, very proud of the fact that every member of our organization is 100% volunteer. Nobody will ever take a dollar and, uh, it's kind of funny. We're very like-minded individuals. I'll try to reimburse somebody and almost every time they end up donating it back to the organization. And it, it kills me because people give so much, myself included, but you, you give so much of yourself, you sacrifice away from your family in time. So when you try to reimburse somebody for fuel or for meals or taking care of a family or doing this or doing that, and they turn around and donate it back, it's like, you know, you, you just want to do the right thing and then they want to do the right thing. And it's, it's a group of selfless individuals and I'm very, I couldn't do what we do by myself. So I'm just very blessed and very fortunate to have like-minded individuals on the team. Oh, absolutely. So I, again, I, I love what you're doing. I love that you turned this very negative incident into a positive one, but I, I want to ask you some questions. The first question I'd like to ask you is, I'd like to go back to the night that you were at that scene with Jamie. Like, what was that like for you? Gut-wrenching. Horrible. Um, you know, you, there's certain things in the job that stick with you, and I still remember the, I, I looked on the computer screen, I read the details, 
the radio broadcast, the radio traffic, mm. um, the the audio, mm. and uh, it's some of that will always stay with us. I, I think, you know, one of the healthy coping mechanisms that uh, I, I recently went through with another incident was the ability to take something and recognize that you're never going to forget it, mm-hmm. but if you can basically compartmentalize it and you have it over here in this part of your head and then move forward in this part of your head. And it, it sounds kind of crazy, but you just have to come to terms with what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've been through, what you've experienced sometimes you can't forget things, but you have to come to terms with being okay with them and moving forward. Absolutely. And so a big part of like what I teach and I talk about a lot is trauma. So the thing about us uh, first responders um, is, and I'm going to say specifically cops, because that's my experience is obviously being a cop is so sometimes like I wasn't even at a, tra- I wasn't at the traumatic scene. I wasn't there when <clears throat> there was a fatal or I wasn't there. We had a quadruple um, murder. It was a quadruple murder and then um, a suicide. And I wasn't, I wasn't the officer that saw the scene, but I did scene security. I heard the radio traffic. Um, I was there the night that rescue came, took all five of the bodies out and the rescue guy had a heart attack. And I heard that radio traffic. Like, and I was kind of there picking up the pieces and while I was never even a part of a debrief that still traumatic like that affected me um very deeply very very deeply right and so you know you went to the scene that obviously affected you would you say that talking about it has helped you at all and the reason before you answer that the reason I'm going to preface that the reason I'm talking to you and asking you about that is because from you know studies and from my own personal experience as well as Um, experience with clients is trauma is unprocessed thoughts and emotions. So it's like what happens in our brain is something really bad happened. Like the scene with Jamie, that really bad happened. So your brain started this neural pathway of ABC. So this happened. And so ABC, and you're going to feel the emotions. You're going to feel, you're going to be able to smell the smells. Like you said, you're going to feel exactly how you felt, the gun gut wrenching. You're probably going to be able to hear voices. Like it just, it takes you right back because your brain developed this neural pathway based on that obviously very, you know, traumatic situation, ABC, ABC. And so anytime you get triggered, something brings it up, you go back to ABC. Whereas some, a lot of times, not all the time, but if we can talk about it and we create new neural pathways, and there's a lot of different ways to do that, but um, then we tend to not be as traumatized by it. Does that make sense? Because we create these new neural pathways. And so I'm just curious if like talking about it has helped you. I I couldn't agree with you anymore. Um, 100% agree. And you touched on several topics. uh, One of which without going into details due to confidentiality, there was an agency that helped out another agency on a horrific, horrific incident. And one of the suggestions that was followed was there was a debriefing with officers involved directly with the incident. Then there was a second debriefing with officers that were doing scene security, traffic, etc. And then there was a debriefing for those that weren't even there, but felt affected. And that's something that is completely new to me you know, within the last two years, that the guilt of not being at a scene can consume somebody as well. And what you said uh, a minute ago, just about the pathways and everything, we're in control of our minds. We are in control, and it's 100% accurate. Uh, for example, I still, for whatever reason, the the scene will come to mind. It was Flamingo and Ravenwood, the intersection uh, where Jamie's vehicle, the final rest was, the position of the vehicle. Uh, those involved, all of us trying to do what we could do to help, being helpless, mm-hmm. not being able to do enough. The helicopter was overhead broadcasting what we were seeing, yeah. hearing that repetitively. Mm-hmm. And you take that, and that's enough that can consume somebody. Hell yeah. With that said, when, when I think about those actual images and those thoughts, I turn around and I look at at the very same time, I can turn around and I could look at, you know, we went to Tarpon Springs uh, 
three years after uh, police officer Charlie Kondek was killed in the line of duty. We brought lunch to a police station. We had a patch project where people sent us patches from different agencies. We framed it. Uh, our secretary, Christine, did a phenomenal job. She worked tirelessly on it. And we presented that to the family. And it's something so simple, something so easy that we just we took a couple hour drive. We brought lunch to the police department and gave a, a framed pro project consisting of patches to the family. And it meant the world. So I'll turn around and have those horrific, vivid images. And then I'll think about a happy image, something like that. Mm. And it's, it's just amazing which way you can go and what direction you could take it. It's almost like if you're in this profession and you're angry every day. You go to work angry every day, you're going to be angry at work. You're going to be angry when you come home. If you go to work and you know that there's things that will phase you that you can't change, but you can absolutely choose how you react, you're going to be happier. It's and one I, of those. I, um, I agree. Thank you. I agree. Go ahead, sir. Well, I agree with that. I, to I just answer your other question about, I just wanted to say, to answer your other question about talking about the incident, 100% mm -hmm. it helps. And the biggest thing that I've seen with our organization and personally is acceptance. What a lot of us, when I say us, I mean first responders in general, but law enforcement officers especially, mm -hmm. we think that we're big, bad, macho, and you know we're the only ones feeling a certain way. But what ends up happening is you find out other people feel the exact same way as you and you feel better about it. And then you get it off your chest. Mm. I couldn't agree more. And that's, you know, that's why too, is like, I'm a, I'm a pretty big advocate for reworking how we do debriefs and, and reworking how we do briefing. And that I think that our daily briefings should actually kind of be debriefings <clears throat> and discussing, you know, what happened the night before the shift before and how people felt you know, we're not, we are not tapping into how our officers are feeling. Um, I know it's an old school mentality. I know it's type A, it's alpha, you know, we don't have feelings, but the truth is, is we, we really do have feelings and, you know, we need to tap into that. Um, that's how we're going to save lives. Um, I, what I wanted to say, and I'm sorry, I think there was a delay, but what I wanted to say is you, you touched upon, you know, how like when officers come in, if they're angry all the time, um, you know, and they're going to be angry everywhere and they have a choice. And, and I do agree. I have to say this. I, I, I do agree. And I talk about that. And I, I will say that I found myself there. Um, and when I was in that situation, I did not feel like I had a choice. Um, I will tell you what happened. And, you know, for all of our listeners, if you feel that way, I know a lot of people land on my podcast who are feeling like I am all by myself. Nobody understands me. This fucking agency, this, you know, this fucking chief, these goddamn coworkers, like that's, those are the conversations that they're having in their head. Sometimes they're having them with me. What I want to say is the, in my opinion, and from my experience, um, we get angry when we lose ourselves to the job. We start to resent the agency. We start to resent law enforcement as a whole when we lose ourselves, we, we have completely lost ourselves. And I get it. We, a lot of us have gone there. We've been there. Um, we have experienced, um, you know, trauma at our agencies. And then it feels like nobody cares about us because they do not have proper support set up, which is obviously a huge mission of mine. Um, but a lot of it is we completely lose ourselves. And so what I like about your story and what I want to highlight to Sheepdog Nation, to all intuitive sheepdogs listening to this, is you went through something traumatic, something that literally hurts my stomach as we discuss it. You saw and experienced something just what every officer never wants to experience, okay? And, and you did, and you could have went one of two ways. And what you did is you turned, you said, okay, I'm, you probably lost yourself for a while. You said you felt really angry. I have some questions about that, but you said you felt really angry and you, you kind of went down this road of just anger, but then, you know, the universe had your back and you, you had to be a little open to it, but the universe guided you to, and getting this bike and doing these rides and, and you turned your grief, you turned all of that into a positive. And now the effects that you're having on law enforcement um, is honestly, it's, it's amazing. And it's what we need, you, you know, Team South Florida, what you guys are doing as 
you're bringing, you're bringing the blue back together. You're showing people that it's not the thin blue line. It's the thick blue line. We're here. I have your back. I'm a cop Been through some shit, but I got you. Like I got you. And, and I just, to me, that speaks volumes because to me, that is what we need more of. Well, I, I couldn't appreciate what you said more, and I probably can't even adequately explain my gratitude for your words because it's so it's so true, and it just hits home. And I think the biggest thing, the biggest problem we have is trust. And when you talk about the debriefings, I'll tell you, I agree with you with mental health and talking and everything, but it'll never happen in, and I like your podcast because you're more direct and blunt than I am, which is hard to do sometimes, but I love it because it's, it's real. What, what we're going to have a hard time doing is going into a briefing with a group of officers, supervisors included, and people feeling comfortable talking. And that's a, tra- a challenge that we have where I currently work with a peer support team. That's a challenge that I've seen second and third hand with other agencies and their teams. And what seems to work for Team South Florida to combat that is we'll get calls, a couple of calls a month, nothing crazy, but we'll get phone calls, we'll get messages, and we'll follow up and we'll speak with these officers. We don't ask your first name. We don't ask your last name. We don't ask what agency you work for. When people realize that there's resources available and they can just vent and talk, and learn that their feelings are normal feelings and normal reactions. It's a breath of fresh air and there's no pressure and there's no stress, there's no judgment, there's no stigma. And I can't tell you when you talk about getting in that place, I I was in that place. When you talk about feeling lost, so many of these officers, and it amazes me from across the country, it's not just Florida. We have, we've been receiving an increased number of calls from New York, in Chicago, for whatever reason. Well, I'll tell, you that, them, but... I'll tell you that reason. The reason is because NYPD is leading the country with the most officer suicides, and Chicago is the second. <laughs> so, um, wow. you know, j- just this year, yeah. just this year, I think NYPD has lost 10, and Chicago's lost six just this year. So, you, I mean, we, we and, are- and one is too many. Oh, hell yes. And, and so I love what you're doing. I love that you have that. Um, and what, a couple of things I want to go back and I want to touch on a couple of things is, you, you know, I love that, you know, so anybody listening to this, so I run the Intuitive Sheepdog Club. It's an ongoing, we have an ongoing chat. We have veteran officers. We have officers from all across the world in every capacity. I've got probation officers. I've got um, state troopers. I've got feds. I've got county guys and girls and I've got you know city cops and everything in between Canada UK New Zealand you name it um we have it and what that what that chat does is while it is annoying to some people if you if you're not in there if you're not in there for the right reasons you know it can get kind of annoying but it's a bunch of cops who are literally supporting each other you know coming in and being like yo I just had this fucking bad day I just had this call I just did this you know, this is happening. Like, what do you guys think I should do? I'm feeling like this, like, and it's confidential and everybody makes up their own Instagram, you know, and nobody has to put a picture of themselves. Nobody has to know what agency anyone works for. And it, it works. It works. So, um, I like that and I like what you're doing. And so that is that peer support from all of us is huge. So any, uh, anybody listening, if you are not feeling like the intuitive sheepdog club is for you, but you feel like you could um, you know, benefit from talking to somebody, check out Team South Florida. Um, they offer that. That's amazing, Rich. I really appreciate that. The second thing that I want to touch upon is the briefings. So here's where um, I agree and I disagree. And, and that's okay. And this is great. And I love having this conversation is I agree with you that it's not, I totally agree. Like sitting a bunch of cops down and being like, hey, tell me about how you feel. Is it like that's, that's, you're absolutely right about that. What I think and how the only thing I disagree on is I think that it can happen. And I'm going to tell you how I think it can happen is I think that it would start from the top down. And I'll be honest with you, I've been consulting with several chiefs right now, which has been amazing. It's something I've really kind of kept under wraps um, until we start, you know, this building this momentum. But I have definitely been consulting with chiefs and bringing me in and they're like, okay, like we hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I see what you're doing. My, my, 
police department needs change, what do I do? And the first thing is, is, is we're not going to focus so, so much on the officers yet. We need to kind of focus, we need to focus on the top because what, what chiefs forget and what admin forget so much is we as boots on the ground, look up to our admins. We look up to those people. And so for an example, if, as I remember, I remember being in this situation, um, although I'm not much of a follower, so I, I didn't fall into this category, but um, you know, and that's probably, <laughs> that's probably why a lot of people didn't like me. <laughs> they probably still don't. It's because I just say it like I feel it. But you know, if you're, if we have a sergeant who's bad mouthing yoga, bad mouthing, you know, EFT tapping, emotional freedom technique, uh, bad mouthing meditation. And yet we're over here trying to, to bring that to a police department. That's not going to work. That's not going to work because the guys underneath that sergeant, I mean, it's, it's going to be like, no, no, fuck that. Like Sarge isn't doing it. Sarge thinks it's just like, I, I agree with you, Sarge. This is bullshit. You know, and, and old school mentality. And that's what we, you know, we, we reach that. So in my opinion, we need to start from the top down and we need to start focusing there. And I'm going to tell you something, the people who want to shit on all of this stuff are the most fucked up of them all. And that's truly how I feel. If you want to shit on all these techniques and all this stuff and, and working on your emotions, you're more fucked up than any, any of us. And you would be the first person that I would sit down and I would have like, not an intervention, but like I would sit down and I would talk with you for a long time, you know, and, and, and show you how messed up you are because, <laughs> because I've been there. The thing is, is I've been there and I've experienced it. Um, and so to just kind of wrap my little autumn rant up, which <laughs> if you listen to my podcast, you know, I go on, sorry, Rich. But the thing is, is that that's what, that's where we need to go. In my opinion, I, I just think that we need to rework our briefings. I need, I think that you, you really hit the nail on the head when you talk about, you know, peer support, I think, but I think it all needs to be redone. I, I think that doing the way we've always done things aren't working. Clearly look at our suicide rates. We have now surpassed the amount of officers that have taken their lives this, just this year have surpassed how, how many officers we've lost in the line of duty. Okay. And this is the second year in a row. I know that last time I checked. I almost double. Huh? Oh, I yeah. almost double. It was, totally. uh, it, it, it was almost, it's over 220 police and corrections exactly. officers this year have taken their lives. Exactly. It's, yep. It's crazy. Shout out Blue Help LE because I always check them for my latest stats. You can find them on Instagram, Sheepdog Nation. Um, yeah, it's crazy. They're, so, they're good yeah. and shadows behind the badge are good too. But let me respond when you're, when you're finished with your autumn rant. I love your autumn rant, by the uh, way. But let me respond when you're done I'm with done. that. I'm done. No, go ahead. I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Okay. No, no, I agree with you. Uh, but two things that I, I made sure to write down starts okay. with the top and old school, two yeah. separate comments. Okay. It go ahead. absolutely a hundred percent starts with the top. And I will follow up with that by saying action speaks louder than words. We hear way too much talk, 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 talk. And we hear, tell me what you think. You have somebody like you or me who says what we think, and then that's not what they want to hear and then forget about it. That's one problem. The second problem is, and I'm not, my little disclaimer here is I'm not specifically referring to one agency. I'm referring to just different people that contact us from different agencies and different experiences. Yeah. But when you have chiefs, lieutenants, captains, sheriffs, directors, when, when you have people that demonstrate by action that they care, it's it, it does wonders for morale yes. and it shows the troops when you have just words, it means absolutely nothing. I'm not going to name him, but there was a, uh, there was a chief in Indiana and I can't tell you how impressed I was. He contacted a widow several months after she lost her husband who was killed in the line of duty. And he reached out and you talk about a humble man, a humble leader. Mm. He said, I want to know what we can do better. Here's what we do. Can you sit down with me and tell me what worked and what didn't work so we can make sure a horrible situation isn't worse from us to a surviving family member? How wow. incredible is that? Amazing. You, you don't see that. You don't see that. But that's, that's when you say starts from the top versus, again, I, I won't name specifics, but versus the opposite where it's yeah. 
let me sit where I can sit. Let me have the cameras on me. Let me make sure I say that it's just, it's a different level. And then the other thing was the old school mentality. I was very touched twice recently, two separate officers, both patrol officers, both over 20 years of experience, both said the same thing with two separate incidents. Thank you for asking how I feel. Thank you for letting me talk. Mm. I've never felt like somebody wanted to hear. So I agree with you 100% about the old school mentality because when I went through field training in Las Vegas, mm. I think just about every one of my field training officers would have said this is crazy. Yeah, it absolutely. It was a different mentality. Yeah. But there are certain exceptions out there and there are certain people that get it. And and the thing is, is it's, I love that you shared that. So I'm, I'm so glad. And, and the old school mentality, now listen, cause I will, I'm just going to say this cause it's like struck me like a lightning bolt is if you, if you've listened to me for any amount of time, then you know that I'm a cop's cop. I love old school. And what I mean, old school, I love, we do the job. We shut our fucking mouths. We have our backs. We're family. That's it. Like that. I love that. What I don't love is, is not asking how you're feeling, not checking in, um, and, and not being there on an emotional level. And that's what we're talking about. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. I think that's what you're talking about too, Rich, is just like the old school of like, 100%. yeah, we just do this job and we just, you shut the fuck up and you suck it up. And I've, I've made a lot of recent podcasts kind of talking about that. Um, there was a situation when I was on FTO just, and, and this is really doesn't have much to do with anything other than just kind of outlining the old school mentality is like when I was on FTO um, and I loved my FTO, like he was great, but he's very old school mentality. And he, and what happened is we were working a four on three off schedule. Well, every so often you'd have to work five days, but you didn't get paid for that fifth day. And I'm sitting here like, wait a minute, I just fucking, I'm putting in 50 hours this week and I'm not getting paid. Like I'm pissed. And so again, in autumn fashion, I brought it up to him and I was like, Hey, like, I don't get this, you know, and instead of sitting there and being like, well, it actually works itself out and giving me like, you know, good information back. He just looked at me and he goes, you should be thankful you have a job. I'm thankful that I'm a police officer. You should be thankful that you're a police officer. If they want you to work three extra fucking days and you don't get paid, that is what you do. And I'm like, well, no, it's not, <laughs> you know, because that's, but that's old school and it's just, we're not there anymore. Like we, we have a new generation of police officers. We are moving more into, this is no longer a job. This is a profession. We have educated individuals in law enforcement and you cannot treat us like shit because we are not going to put up with it. And like, that's just this new generation, which is nothing wrong with it because I think that we're going to change law enforcement as a whole and it's going to be better. That's what I think. So I just want to say, I just want to wrap this up by saying, Rich, like, I love what you're doing. I love how you turn this incident that you had very dramatic. I want to, you know, I just want to take a moment to recognize Jamie. I want to, I want to send out good vibes to his family and, and to him and to you and to all officers that were affected that night by that tremendous loss. Um, and I want to just take a moment to highlight all officers that we've lost in the line of duty. Um, we, we do not forget. We do not forget. And I, and I love so deeply much, honestly, um, so deeply much what you and your organization is doing. Um, and I knew as soon as I, I hit the link, I hit a link and I, in your, in your Instagram bio and I read, and as soon as I started reading and I, I came across that story, I just knew that I was going to like you and your organization um, because you are the you are the one percent within the one percent that I talk about. You are you took yourself from a low, an extreme low, a low that all of us can fucking understand. If you've been a cop for any amount of time, then you know that low, and you took yourself from that low and look at you. And what I want to highlight for everyone listening is that can be you. Let Team South Florida, let Rich be an inspiration to you. Let, you know, the Intuitive Sheepdog podcast, like let this movement be an inspiration to you. I, I too was in a low. I was couch ridden. I got injured. I faced crippling anxiety. I couldn't fucking go to a restaurant. I couldn't go grocery shopping. I couldn't drive through a city. Like I, I experienced all of this stuff when I got, you know, 
injured from being a police officer and I I had a decision to make and it wasn't I didn't come to a crossroads one day and then just take a left instead of a right like it was ongoing and it's been ongoing it's been unfold unfolding and every day I have to get up and I rich I don't want to put words in your mouth but I'm assuming you're the same way like I have to get up every day and I have to make a decision I can be angry at law enforcement and I can and I can say fuck the culture and they fucked me over and fuck everybody and, and I can do all that or I can do what I'm doing and helping the culture and just like you rich you you know you probably have to do the same thing i don't want to put words in your mouth so i'd like to hear what your opinion no you're you're not putting words in my mouth you're speaking exactly how i feel and to those that are in a bad spot because any anybody that's done this job for any number of time they've likely been in a spot where they either feel targeted they feel micromanaged they feel like something's not appreciated they feel like somebody's getting you know the better end of the deal whatever it is the best revenge the best way to overcome that is by success. So if somebody is making it a negative workplace and you're able to deflect that, go out there, do your job and do it well, that's the best thing that you can do to push back against negativity. And stay true to you. The last thing just to, just to say that is it's just straight, it's staying true to who you are. The moment you lose yourself, in the negativity and and all of the stuff you've seen is that's the moment you start going down a slippery path i know because i did that i lost myself i lost myself to the job i let the job consume me and so when what happened is when i got injured i lost my entire identity i would sit on the couch and i'm like who the fuck am i i don't even know who i am like i've been officer clifford that's my maiden name i've been officer clifford since i've been 20 years old that that's who i am i have a fucking master's in criminal justice like i that is who i am and now i'm not and now i'm not and now i can't and who am i and, and you know so the thing is sheepdogs focus on not losing yourself i think that's the that's the long and the short of everything that rich and i've really talked about is it's just don't lose yourself to this job allow yourself to feel your feelings allow yourself to feel your emotions to talk about your emotions reach out when necessary you know, Rich's uh, Team South Florida, great organization, um, always there for you to call. Uh, you can join the Intuitive Sheepdog Club, so we specialize in, um, and and always try to lean a little bit more optimist than pessimist. Glass can always be half full. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. There's more yeah. resources now than ever before. One hundred percent. 100%. And, and it's normal to not be okay. Like, let's just be honest, because you can't see and do Great. and experience the shit that we have and be okay. Because it's just not, Absolutely. you know, if, if you're, I mean, okay, in my opinion, if you're okay, and you have never gotten help, and you've never, you know, explored um, the spirituality side, your, you know, your inner truth, if you've never done any kind of healing, the truth is, is you're probably really not okay. Like, and that's just how I feel. And that's another podcast. Okay. And that's another rant. <laughs> I'll get on that. But, but, you know, just, I just want everyone to hear us deeply when we say like, look at us, like we both are fucked up. And, I, and it doesn't mean we're not still fucked up in some way, like, but we're healing ourselves every day and we're, and we're putting good stuff back out there and we're changing the culture, um, you know, in our own ways. And that can be you. So instead of taking and being negative and just taking, taking, taking all that energy, let's, um, let's really focus our energy into positive spots. And Rich, before we get off, is there anything that you would like to leave us with? Anything you'd like to say? I just want to thank you because conversations like this are so needed. They need to be had. People need to see that. And to those that are in the profession, remember why you got into the profession. Ignore the negativity, ignore the BS, do your job, but most importantly, take care of each other. Mm. If you surround yourself with negative people, you're going to be negative. Find the few people that are more positive, that are happy, that are humble. I was very, very blessed. I don't know where my life would be, especially professionally. I don't know where my life would be if I didn't have such incredible academy instructors that were humble. You don't see humble veterans as often now as you did back then. Mm -hmm. So just take care of each other. It's, you know, sometimes just asking somebody how they're doing opens up Pandora's box. Oh yeah. Huge. I love that. 
Um, and so in intuitive sheepdog style, Rich, what I'd like to do, Sheepdog Nation, what I want to do is I just want to take a moment um, since uh, we've had my teacher on the podcast, Gabby Bernstein. She she left us with a prayer and I've made a commitment that every time um, we end a podcast, I'd like to end in a prayer. I'd like to take a moment. So if you are in a position to be able to close your eyes, please do that. If you're driving, please do not. Um, but let's just, I'd like to hold space and I'd like to call in our angels and I would just like to ask the universe to have every single one of ours backs continuously. I would like to ask that our angels, uh, Archangel Michael protects all of us, protects all sheep dogs. And I would like for you to be open to making space for the universe to have your back and be open, be open to the new conversations and be open to the blessings and the miracles that are in your life every single day. And to not, not keep your eyes closed and to be open to them and be grateful for them. Thank you, universe. Thank you, angels, for being here with us. And sheepdogs, we will see you next time.